Good morning and welcome to the Morning Scoop for Thursday, November 25th. This is your Daily Buckeye Fix. I'm Tom Moore. The game against Michigan is in two days. Thanksgiving is today. Happy Thanksgiving to you all. This has been a really fun week of shows. There has been a ton to talk about during what is always one of the most exciting weeks of the year around Columbus and the state of Ohio. Yesterday, we took a schematic look at what worked so well for the Ohio State offense against Michigan State and what it meant for the Michigan game. Today, we're going to be talking about the Buckeye defense, but those very same topics with my very same guest. His name is Ross Fulton. He is Buckeye Scoop's X's Nose Guru. Ross, thank you for joining me yet again. Good to be here, Tom. So it feels like Ohio State has kind of been tinkering with their defense pretty consistently over the last couple of months. Last week, one of the big changes that sort of emerged was the growth of Craig Young's role. So what are they doing with Craig Young right now, and what does that bring to the defense? Yeah, well, you know, you have to keep tinkering when you you spend the all six months in the offseason not changing your defense, and then you have to do it on the fly <laughs> for two months during the season. It's a, you know, it's a constant work in progress. But um, so at, if we go back in time when we talked about some of these changes, I think you and I discussed this, or, uh, you know, at least I discussed it on the uh, Buckeye Scoop, which is, you know, that cover safety role is now what I would call, I talked about, use the terms of my article, the overhang or the field apex, basically the guy who is outside, but essentially a second level player just outside of the tackle or the tight end. Um, that is the position essentially that, that traditionally was where the FAM linebacker played. And so as you can start to see, um, you know, that role has some responsibilities. And so, you know, when I made when they made these changes, they flipped everything around. Kind of what the bullet was meant to be is actually now that position. And so, you know, I, I kind of kept wondering it. It was, you know, they didn't play a team that is really a run heavy 12 personal offense. If they would use Craig Young in those situations as more of a quasi uh, hybrid linebacker, and uh, they did. So when Michigan State went 12 personnel, Craig Young came in as the at the quote unquote cover safety spot. Um, and, you know, essentially it doesn't change the defense, you know, which is, I mean, Young is practice at that position. They, do, they go through all the same drills and stuff, and it just gives you a bigger body, basically. Um, you know, Marcus Williamson and Latham Ranson are both for like 200 pound guys or whatever they are, you know, as essentially safeties have been pretty impressive and sticking their nose in there and, you know, blitzing in the line. But again, Young obviously is a bigger defender. And so, that I will only imagine that, that will continue to be his role in Saturday against Michigan, who is a spread offense that loves to use two tight ends. And they have two good ones. And so you'll see, I'm sure, a lot of two tight end packages. Um, and, you know, so it'll be, a, it'll be a challenge because I think Craig Young has a lot of uh, a good skill set, but he hasn't played a lot of snaps this year on the base defense. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see how the high mix and matches that. So that's one of the changes they've made recently. One of the big changes earlier in the fall was the Buckeyes switching their defense and playing more cover four. We talked at the beginning of the season, lots of single highs, so cover one, cover three. Then they started mixing in more cover four. But more recently, they've started mixing in more different variations of cover four. So can you explain what teams were starting to do to take advantage of what was maybe getting a little predictable for Ohio State and what Ohio State is doing in response? Yeah, so when Ohio State started playing cover four, they basically use what the term is cover for Meg or cover for man. And so that just, the Meg refers to the corners being in man everywhere he, they go. So again, you put the corner on the outside receiver and they're in man coverage, just like you were playing cover one, except you're in cover four now. And so, you know, like anything else that can have, have some downsides, right? So uh, and takes away, so on the one hand, it's great. Cause if your corners can do that, you basically have eliminated part of the field and now you can, in the cover four pattern match inside, you can have your safeties play more aggressively against the run. And, and so they're still using a lot of it. But, you know, there's certain downsides, like if a team must run a bunch of crossing routes, it kind of defeats some of the purpose of cover four if you're, if you're corner safety. Or uh, if, you know, one easy way to run the football at it is you just have the, the wide receiver run the corner off. And now you've taken him, out, just like you would get, again, against a man coverage defender. And so, you've taken them out of the play. So particularly you see Ohio State, you know, there's different terms you could use for it, but we'll just for ease say playing more cover four mod, which means man only deep. Uh, it's a more traditional cover four. It's what I probably Ohio State sees the most of when they face cover four because it's a little safer, right? Your corner, as the name implies, 
is now getting depth and only taking, he'll take the wide receiver and man if they go vertical, but if they cross or go underneath or click out, he, he lets them go and keeps getting depth. And so a, a lot of where you're seeing Ohio State do that is, you know, one of the advantages of cover four, as I talked about in my article, is you can basically split the field in half and you separate coverages to each side. And so, you know, though against Michigan State in particular, they put a lot of, they put cover four Meg to the field and cover four Mod to the boundary. Particularly when Michigan State put their tight end to the boundary, like a run heavy side. And so I, you know, I think the th- thought process is as, you know, to what we just discussed is, hey, if if they're going to run the ball at that side, we don't want our corner just turning and automatically running down the field. We want him to at least be able to provide some force support and force the ball inside. Because uh, as we talk about, that boundary is is kind of where Ohio State remains vulnerable. Uh, and as well as, you know, if you have a tight end over there, you know, it's a less you you don't expect as much of a vertical threat immediately down the field it, or, you know, as it, it changes what an offense is going to do pass pattern wise and, and things of that nature. And so you're seeing them mix that more in. They'll also do it if like an off of, you know, if they see wide receivers in like a stack alignment, which Ohio State itself likes to do a lot with those wide receivers, you know, basically one behind the other. They'll do that just to kind of protect themselves. On the like, so again, as you said, they're slowly, they slowly are adding things in during the season uh, to the point where, you know, they have more variety in cover four. They also have a lot more variety in cover one and cover three than they used to have. One of the big question marks for the OSU defense going into this weekend is the potential matchup with Eric All, the tight end for Michigan. He's starting to play a bigger role in that Michigan offense. You wrote about something that Michigan State did to try and catch Ronnie Hickman out of position with the tight end. What was it and how can Ohio State avoid that again, issue against Michigan? Yeah, and so again, so a lot of what Michigan State did, and like they had a, a frankly a nice game plan. I mean, it just they couldn't keep up. It, but like, you know, they they ran a lot of again as I was sort of referring to, like they put their wide receivers to the to the wide field and then the tight end to the boundary, and it's called a nub alignment. You know, they have trips to one side and the tight end to the to the nub side or the the short side, and so it stresses the defense. So High State does it all the time on offense too because you now have. Your run threat to the, the short side, and the but you have a lot of grass to cover to the field, and so it, it forces defenses to sort of choose how they want to align. And you know, like when in doubt, Ohio State wants Ronnie Hickman to do a lot for them, like especially in cover four, but also in cover three. Like in cover four, you know, when they, as I talked about my article this week, like when there's trips to one side, they use a poach poach technique. So like Hickman's going to come over and pick up. You know, if you think about trips with three wide receivers to one side, the inside receiver, if that guy goes vertical, Hickman's going to come over and get him. They also want him to be more aggressive playing the run. And so particularly the boundary against so their they're down numbers there, they need him to fit the run. And so, you know, one threat obviously is that uh, you get hard play action and you try to throw the ball down the vertical. You know, it's a question of like, I think Eric Hall can do that. You know, a lot of tight ends aren't vertical threats. You know, and you have to come on the corner to help pick that up. Now, whether Cade McNamara that fits his skill set maybe is a different question, but you know, I think a lot of Michigan's game plan is going to be structured at the outset, particularly sort of running. They love like they love counter tray, counter OH, they love bucks, you know, gap run plays, two tight ends, running towards that short side of the field. You just don't have Ohio State doesn't have the same numbers there. But Michigan State last week, speaking of, speaking of the run game, Michigan State didn't have big numbers in the run game last week, but they did find some things to take advantage of. It just when you're down nine million points in the first half, you can't run the ball as much as you might want to otherwise. So what did Michigan State take advantage of last week and how big of a concern is that going into the Michigan game? Yeah, and, and so this goes to what I was talking about. So, you know, they had a couple nice design plays to, to get again towards that short field because Ohio State. They, they they've changed so much. So right. So we start with the fact that they've changed like how they align their front, and so they tend to put what I would it's called an under to the field. So you got you know essentially your nose tackle to the wide side of the field, no matter what the offensive formation is, and your three techniques. So they've done that. I, I kind of laid out in my article by gap, but it basically takes again that cover safety out of being in the box. It also t- and then to the field and then to the short side of the field. They a lot of times want to put the defensive end head up over the, the tackle or the tight end to again keep that corner or Hickman, the same boundary safety out of the run fit immediately. But in doing so, you you risk getting outflanked to the edge. And so, you know, Michigan State used 
a couple, you know, they they like faked like they were going to run zone to the wide field, and then it's called like a lineback play. Like he Walker followed the tight end uh, to the boundary alley, and so you know they're clearly their focus was they thought that they could get numbers to the short side. And again, as I said, I think you know now Michigan's put a lot of that on film, so you know I think it's, at some level it's a little bit of a trade off, right? And, and part of that's why Ohio State again has to that short field, they'll have both Hickman and Steel Chambers. They're like two of their, their better athletes, better tacklers in space. So you you trade off just like the pure X's and O's count, and then you, you hope to make up for that a little bit as well. One of my favorite stats, and one that I feel like I've repeated maybe a dozen times this week on various shows, is that the team that averages more yards per rush has won every Ohio State Michigan game since 2002. To me, that's sort of a decent proxy for controlling the line of scrimmage and winning in the trenches, which it's Ohio State, Michigan. That kind of makes sense. So do you think Ohio State controls the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball on Saturday? And if not, which side of the ball is more of a concern to you, a bigger concern in terms of Ohio State maybe not being able to win on that side of the ball? You know, it's interesting, too, because, again, we were, we were talking yesterday about, you know, passing yards per attempt is a better stat and, and rushing yards per attempt. It's interesting because. Michigan's run the ball a lot more than Ohio State this year, but Ohio State actually has a better rush yards per attempt. And, and mm-hmm. as we've talked about, you know, a lot of what defenses are doing to Ohio State, people like you can look at the like the sheer number and Ohio State like like oh Ohio State throws it a lot, but teams are still very committed to stopping the Ohio State run game, which is why they're throwing it a lot. And so all that's to say is that I mean I think you know <laughs> if I, I guess probably the bigger concern would be if, if Michigan is gaining just chunks of yards and able to grind it on the ground. I mean, you don't want to see like, you know, people talk about the Oregon game and it's like, you might as well, that's like comparing what Ohio State did against Don Brown's defense because the scheme is so different. It's not a great point at this point, but like, you know, if teams are again, like sort of gaining six yards of play, that's obviously a concern. I just, I, I, the, the way the teams have controlled the line of scrimmage against the Ohio State offense, quote unquote, is, is not, in the sense of like beating blocks it's in the sense of like slanting and stunting and that kind of stuff like penn state did um you know high, uh, michigan doesn't do a ton, ton of that they will zone blitz I, but you know to me as long as ohio state's getting the ball outside if they're trying to do that they're they'll be okay so I, I i do think it comes down to i think ohio state remains so much of a defensive line driven team that you know like on saturday i mean haskell garrett is he really is a difference maker and you know there's games he doesn't play as much because of injury and whatnot but if he if he plays like he did on saturday that that would put ohio state in a good starting point so if you are matt barnes we talked about the fact that they've changed what they're doing especially since that barnes has taken over so if you are matt barnes how do you attack the michigan offense are you i mean they haven't been explosive as all at all in the run game like you just said i assume though that's probably what they want to do if they have their choice is be able to run the ball and keep the ohio state offense off the field so my assumption is you probably look to stop that and make Cade McNamara beat you. But I mean, what, if you're, if you're Matt Barnes, what are you doing this weekend? Yeah. I mean, I think I'm taking a little bit of my game plan from Penn state, which is mix in quite a few of, of cover three zone pressures early, you know, bringing either the, the cover safety from the field or the boundary corner from the boundary. I mean, that's one way we you can combat people running a lot to the short field as you blitz the corner right into it. Um, you know, I think, for Ohio State, even more so. I mean, any any offense is not as good when they get behind schedule, but I think that would put Michigan in a worse position. I mean, I do think, you know, Ohio State's defense remains stellar vulnerable to giving up third down completions. But, like, I, I just – I've struggled seeing Michigan creating explosive plays out of the passing game unless it's coming from, like, Blake Corum or Donovan Edwards. Uh, you know, like Michigan will go empty to try to feature those guys. And that and that's as much tackling in space. And so, you know, I think you're going to see if I was them, I'd mix in a lot of cover four to get my safe kid Hickman involved against the run. And then a lot of, you know, cover three pressures. And then on third down, I'd probably play cover one and take my chances. And, and just try and keep keep things in front of them, make Michigan be methodical going down the field more or less. Yeah, agreed. I mean, I think you want to try to force them behind schedule on early downs and put them out of their comfort zone. Um, you know, I mean, the the tailbacks for Michigan are are really good players, and like Haskins will break tackles. Corum and is very explosive if he plays. So, you know, I, I don't think that the Ohio State is going to 
shut them down like they did Michigan State, although, you know, I, I probably wouldn't have said that they were going to do that to Michigan State either. I mean, if I State the defensive tackles consistently win inside like they were. And I do think Ohio State has an advantage in terms of their defensive line versus the Michigan offensive line. Um, you know, I, to me, that's that's still remains the key to the game. Well, yeah, my next question was going to be, is there one thing you would see on Saturday that would make you think Ohio State's going to be in great shape? And, and is that is that the answer? If the Michigan if the Michigan interior offensive line is collapsing under Haskell Garrett and those guys, is that is that the answer to that question? Yeah, I mean, if you see the – it's in, to me, like, it's not even just Haskell Garrett, too. Like, I think one of the unheralded aspects of the improvement of the defense even beyond the scheme is how well the nose tackles have played, like Antoine Jackson and Jerron Cage. Like, those guys beat a lot of blocks. You know, um, and so, you know, if you're if you're getting guys in the backfield like that uh, and they're they're closing off cutback lanes, you know, that would make me feel pretty good. Um, you know, again, I think you want to you want to force Michigan to drive the football and definitely you don't want to be giving up explosive plays on the ground. Like I think even on Saturday against Michigan State, there were a couple of plays early where Walker got scooted out. And I mean, there were some nice runs by him. But Ohio State still got him down, before, you know, to a 10, 12 yard gain. And, and that's you want to do that and, and live to fight the, the next play. Is there one thing that you could see that would think you make you think, OK, this is this could be like a four quarter game or at least a you know miserable, uncomfortable game for Ohio State fans that, that you know, what what is what could Michigan do on offense that would make you think like, oh, boy, this is going to be a 60 minute game? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I will say, like, I think that for the most part, like Harbaugh's teams have had a pretty good game plan for Ohio State's defenses over the last few years you know it sometimes peters out at the end just as a talent basis but like they generally are, are pretty well prepared and ready to go to, to exploit some weaknesses so you know I, I think the thing that would would concern me is a if again if they're gaining you know if Hassan Askins is averaging over five yards of carry that, I mean, that would be a problem obviously you know if they hit an early you know, running back wheel or, or all on a, you know, tight end delays. They love tight end delays, you know, things that like cause that basically take that show that Ohio state isn't on top of what they need to be doing in terms of their keys. That would obviously be concerning, but you know, again, against Michigan state, Michigan state tried a ton of different types of screens and Ohio state basically snuffed out everyone. So, you know, they're, they're definitely on the right trajectory. I, I don't certainly don't see them shutting down Michigan like that, but I think you want to make them grind it out to the point where you can then, you know, eventually Ohio State's offense is going to be more explosive than Michigan's offense. And so you want that to kind of build the, the scales over the course of the game. Well, uh, we will all get to find out together if that is uh, how things play out on the uh, on Saturday, Saturday at noon on Fox. It is the game. It is the one we have counting down, been counting down to for uh, 12 months now, and uh, it is finally here. Should be uh, should be a fun one. So, Ross, thank you for joining me. Happy to, Tom. And uh, make sure you check out Ross's content at uh, BuckeyeScoop.com. He has uh, wrote, written an article on the Ohio State offense and Ohio State defense this week. He's done that a number of weeks in the past, and uh, but always has always has great insight. Also, always has great analysis. You will come away f- uh, a little smarter than you uh, than you started the uh, when you when you read one of those articles. Those are all also free, so that's that is not something you need to be a member for. So check those all out at BuckeyeScoop.com. That'll do it for today. Thank you guys all for joining us. Have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow.